This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. This chapter deals with internal control and its use in the auditing process. So on the screen at the moment, uh, what we have is the overview of the auditing process. Remember, we've planned the audit. Uh, We have, from our planning, assessed where there's risk. and We have uh, decided how we're going to reduce the risk, the audit risk, the risk of us not uh, uh, giving an appropriate audit opinion, reduce uh, the risk to something which is acceptable. And we respond to the risk generally by doing more work or doing different work. And hopefully on our planning visit, uh, or maybe because this is an old client that we we, we know quite well, we have decided that the uh, appropriate uh, way to at least uh, attempt to to be doing this audit is is to go down the left-hand route. We uh, begin, we believe that there's going to be effective controls there. And what we're going to do is to say, right, Things can go wrong within the client's accounting system, but they've got a really good internal control system that will reduce the chance of things going wrong. And if they do go wrong, then the chances are that the client has picked up those errors already and corrected them. Uh, And what we're going to do is we are going to uh, rely or test the system of internal control. And if it is satisfactory, then our substantive tests can be kept small. If, however, we discover that the controls are either not designed well or are not operating very well, uh, then we're going to be, of course, changing uh, our approach uh, there. And we're going to be moving away from relying on internal controls, moving across to putting reliance on anything we can do, which is substantive testing, which is doing an awful lot of testing ourselves. What is in the, uh, what are, what are the, the steps, basically, in the systems-based audit. The first thing we have to do is to record the system, uh, because unless you record the system, you won't understand the system. And in particular, you won't understand where there may be what we could call control mechanisms at work. Uh, We have to record, for example, whether or not overtime has been authorized. We have to record whether issues from stores have been authorized. Uh, We have to record whether or not uh, when people receive statements from suppliers, they reconcile that through their accounts in a payables ledger. We have to record whether or not there's a a, a regular uh, reconciliation between the cash account and the bank. Uh, We have to record effectively the way documents flow, uh, because as auditors, we need to be able to go and find documents We need to know what happens orders or copy orders. We need to know what happens dispatch notes and goods received notes. Are they uh, filed alphabetically? Are they filed in numerical order? Are they filed by date? Uh, All of this is is part of recording the system so we really understand what's going on. Now, why do businesses have these these fairly complicated systems? Or why do we hope they have these fairly complicated systems? And it might be worthwhile just thinking about one's kind of private finances. Uh, I would imagine that many of you uh, will have had problems uh, maybe remembering whether or not you you know, you paid that electricity bill or maybe forgetting to pay your phone bill or, or, or looking at your, your, your bank account statement and seeing a kind of payment there and thinking, what on earth was, was, was that for? Uh, you may have forgotten to pay your credit card bill on time, so that you are, you know, charged uh, interest, a penalty of some sort. And and it's easy to get, if you like, slightly confused when you're dealing with very simple transactions in your own life. Uh, think how easy it is for a company, a trading company, with hundreds, maybe thousands of transactions per day. Maybe these transactions. Uh, dealt with by a team of people, so that one person does have all, doesn't have all the knowledge, they are going to get completely confused, completely lost in these transactions if they don't have a very lay, well laid down system of internal control, which will tell people exactly what to do, where to file things, when to match documents, when to 
um, check that the calculation is correct and so on. So we have to record that system. Then we're going to evaluate it. We're going to make a judgment as to whether or not uh, we think the system is putting into place the controls we would hope to, to have. So if we find that overtime is worked without any sort of authorization, we would see immediately there's a kind of a gap, a weakness there, as it will be called, in the internal control system. There's nothing to prevent people authorizing their own overtime, and presumably the wage bill will go up and up. We test the system because it can be a disparity between what people should do and what people do do. Uh, sometimes people will deliberately take shortcuts. Sometimes things just fall into disuse. You're supposed to do this, but over a period of time, people kind of forget to do it. They're not maybe properly supervised. They're not made to do it. And this system, which started off rather perfect, uh, degenerates. We hope the controls are operating effectively. They have to be operating effectively if we're going to be relying on them. And what we do is if we come across a control weakness, either a weakness which was part of bad design or a weakness which has grown because of bad operation of those controls, then we report that to management. If we can't rely on controls, then we have to change over and do substantive testing. Because what we're really saying is that company and its staff uh, are taking inadequate steps to uh, control the transactions, control the assets, safeguard the assets. And if a company isn't doing it, then we as the auditors are the, the last line of defense, if you like, uh, to try to ensure that the financial statements are free of material misstatement. So what are the uh, components of internal control? And you need to know these five components. First of all, there is something which is called a control environment. And we, we did mention this very briefly earlier. It's like the culture within the organization. In some businesses, the and it's largely said by the people at the top, in some businesses, the, the people at the top are very, very particular, very almost fussy, if you like, uh, that the accounting and record keeping is kept very well indeed. Uh, and they are really quite strict with staff and say, look, you, you have to do this reconciliation, you have to authorize that, you have to check that the price list and so on. In other organizations, there is more a culture of sloppiness uh, that perhaps people find these uh, procedures, these uh, bureaucratic procedures to some extent, they find them tedious. They have an idea that these prevent them getting out and making money selling. They're a, a kind of distraction we can do without. And maybe we could just think of two types of uh, uh, business. One started by a couple of accountants. And accountants, by their nature, tend to be fairly meticulous in recording information and so on. We tend to quite like things being recorded in, in detail, being able to trace back and so on. It's just our nature. And if these uh, people who started the business were accountants, then they value, they treasure internal control. And there's a con very favorable control environment then. They're going to stand no nonsense uh, in, uh, in uh, people not following the rules. You could take another business, let's, for the sake of argument, say it was started by a couple of salespeople. Salespeople are often, and I don't want to, to, to call everyone the same, but salespeople are often not as interested in recording details. Salespeople are more interested in going out and kind of getting the next sale. A very important and essential exercise in successful businesses. But, but very often they, they, they find the form filling a little bit tedious. And if they were to get to the top of the organization, then the esteem by which they hold the system of internal control is going to be much lower. So control environment, is it favorable to a good system of internal control? And is it supporting people doing things properly? So then control activities, what exactly do people do to impose internal control. We'll see a list of this later, but an example would be a, a, a regular bank reconciliation. Another example is 
authorizing transactions before they uh, are allowed to go through. Risk assessment processes. Risk assessment process is really saying that no business stands still. Businesses change what they do. And when businesses change what they do, then you have to assess the new risks which arise and think, do I need uh, another internal control to, to deal with these new transactions? For example, if you begin exporting, if you begin exporting, then you're maybe going to be receiving foreign currency. Do we need some sort of control in place to try to make sure that we don't suffer or minimize foreign exchange losses if the amount of currency we are going to be getting in from a sale is going to be depreciating. Or if we find that uh, 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 one particular sort of inventory is growing, uh, then we have to think, oh, this is very high value inventory. It's very portable. It's very desirable. Perhaps now what we need to do is to lock away the high value inventory in a special bit of the warehouse to safeguard it. So nothing stands still. Uh, management has to be uh, aware and alive to changes in risk and be prepared to let the system of internal control evolve. Information system. Uh, a good example of an information system uh, would be uh, producing aged receivables analyses. An aged receivable analysis saying these invoices are 30 days old, these are 30 to 60, these are 60 to 90, these are over 90 and so on. That's in a way nothing to do with double entry bookkeeping. This is extracting information from the receivables ledger and producing pure management information which itself can be a very useful form of internal control. Another example, uh, if uh, the company has got monthly management accounts, got monthly management accounts being produced, it compares that to the budget. It means every month they're kind of doing a little bit of control. Why have sales fallen? Why have costs gone up? Why have overtime payments gone up? And it gives some time, to, maybe, to to investigate this part way through the year and to find errors part way through the year and stop them. If they didn't have monthly management accounts and they wait to the end of the year and suddenly then they discover these costs are far higher than we expected, uh, then, then the internal control is not nearly as good. And finally, monitoring controls to make sure they're still relevant uh, we said earlier in risk assessment processes the invention of new controls to deal with new risks but we also have to make sure that we're not uh, still having controls which are no longer needed because uh, to some extent enforcing internal controls is taking somebody's time and if we're, we're not making any use of that if it's useless we should we, we should abandon it we have to make sure that people keep carrying out the controls as we intended we supervise, we monitor uh, the uh, implementation or the effectiveness of these controls. Some people remember this by the acronym CRIME. Uh, this would be, uh, the C would be control activities. The R would be the risk assessment process. I is information system. Uh, the M is a monitoring. And then at the end, we have the environment, the control environment. When you're looking at internal control systems and assessing them, and you will have to do this in exam questions, they will describe an in, you know, maybe a sales system or a wages system, and you have to point out where there may be weaknesses in this system. Always think, what can go wrong? Remember a moment ago I said, think what can go wrong in your private finances. Have I paid that invoice? Maybe I've paid it twice. Have I paid it on time? What was that amount for that I see coming out of my bank uh, account and so on? Uh, these can all go wrong in you know, simple personal finances. Think what can go wrong in a large business with thousands of transactions? And we want to try to prevent that. What are the control activities? And first we have something which is called segregation of duties. Segregation of duties means that ideally 
one person cannot be in charge of all of one transaction. You want to break up the stages of transaction or segregate it into different stages and give each stage of the transaction to a different person. There are two reasons for this. First, if we let's 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 consider purchasing, purchasing of raw materials, for example. If one person is in charge of purchasing, uh, in other words, they place the order, they receive the goods, they approve the invoice, and maybe they actually uh, um, approve the credit transfer to pay that uh, supplier, this makes fraud much easier. Now, auditors do not have at the front of their mind fraud, but they are aware it can happen. So if one person can order goods, uh, say that the goods have been received, prove the invoice and pay the invoice, what's to stop them ordering goods for themselves or their friends and relatives? Once you break up a transaction, one person orders, another receives, another one sees the invoice and so on, you have several people involved, and the only way in which fraud can really happen is by the process of collusion. Collusion is a a kind of cooperation between these people. They must all be in on the act, so to speak. And that's a bit dangerous for a fraudster. The, the safest fraud is to keep it all to yourself. Once you begin sharing what you're doing with somebody else, there's a chance that they're going to blow the whistle on what you're doing. The second reason for segregation of duties is as an element of uh, checking up on each other, not for fraud necessarily, but just for error. So if I place an order for goods uh, and then another person receives the goods and can check the goods received note to the order, they will maybe see an error. They will maybe say, well, why have you ordered a thousand of these when actually we only use about 10 a year? You know, maybe I've made an error in the order. And then when somebody else gets the invoice coming in and they compare that to goods received note, they see there's a, maybe a discrepancy uh, within that. And then a, a fourth person is going to pay the invoice. Uh, they take a fresh look at the whole transaction. And quite often when people are paying amounts out to suppliers, they want to see the order. They want to see the goods received. They want to see the invoice. They want to see these three documents as the ultimate proof that the goods were ordered, received, and now we're about to pay for them. Authorization, we've talked about this. Uh, authorizing uh, orders being placed with suppliers. Uh, authorizing perhaps a credit limit uh, on a new customer, authorizing overtime being paid to a customer, uh, authorization by a, a supervisor of some sort is is almost universal. It's it's very difficult almost to think of a transaction where it would be wrong maybe to suggest well this should be signed as authorization. Obviously, when you get on a bus, you don't expect the bus driver to sign the ticket and so on. It can become you know, too, too, too trivial, uh, but authorization is very, very uh, powerful method of uh, uh, enforcing a, some sort of a control activity. Computer controls, we'll be seeing computer controls in a separate section, but for example, just having a password. Uh, if, if you have to put in a password before you can do some sort of a transaction, uh, then there's an element of control. And if then, because of your password, this person, this system knows who's logged on and any transaction can be traced back to you, it makes you think. You know, if, if you can process computer transactions anonymously, apart from the potential of fraud, uh, being anonymous in a way encourages being careless. Uh, but if the transaction can be traced back to you, then presumably you're going to think more carefully about it. Arithmetic controls, like when you receive an invoice from a, uh, a supplier, add it up, make sure it's right, make sure they've calculated the tax correctly and so on. Maybe if you're working at wages by hand, really quite complicated transactions, uh, easy could, to make an arithmetic error, get a second person to check the arithmetic. Physical controls. Physical controls uh, happen with uh, non-current assets. So, for example, laptop computers are very desirable, uh, and most companies will 
you know, stick some sort of identifier onto the laptop computer. They might insist that all laptops are locked away and off as drawers. They might insist that there's a kind of cable attached to the laptop going around the desk leg or something of that sort. Inventory. Uh, inventory should be safeguarded. Inventory is often very valuable. Uh, and uh, very often inventory is kept in stores and only issued uh, on uh, properly authorised requisition notes given to the, the storeman. And cash. Cash should be uh, uh, safeguarded. Uh, you should, uh, in, a, in a retail business where you get a lot of cash, uh, part of the internal control is to make sure that most of the cash is bagged daily because if it just kind of hangs around in tills and drawers and so on, you can be sure it's going to go missing. And then maintaining a, uh, a trial balance and control accounts uh, does the total of the uh, payables uh, ledger reconcile with the payables control account? And if it doesn't, something's gone wrong in the detail. Take out a regular trial balance to make sure something hasn't gone astray. Less important, maybe to some extent, in computerized systems, <coughs> where many of them will not allow you uh, to put in a one-sided entry. Uh, and many of them will make sure that if I debit a particular customer with $100 and the control account is debited with $100 as well. But things can go wrong. I can remember once, uh, this is quite an old and badly designed system, doing, doing some journals in a computer system. And the way I did it, it says, you know, what's the debit? A hundred, you know, where's it going? And it, it would kind of post that, and then it would say, where does the credit go? A hundred, and would it make sure that, you know, maybe you could put in 80 and 20, but the, the, the sum of the credits, you know, had to balance the debit before it let you complete the whole transaction. And I've done my debit. Uh, I, I debited this, this amount to depreciation expense or something. And before I had a chance to do my credit entries, somebody walking across the office floor, their foot caught on the cable to the computer and it switched off. So that wasn't a, a great way to turn down, to, to, to run down your uh, <coughs> computer. So I switched it on again, went into the accounting program, and a great kind of alarms beeped here, uh, saying that we had a trial balance that didn't balance because a debit had been processed without the credit. And of course, uh, the thing wouldn't let you then do a one-sided credit entry uh, to correct the, the, the trial balance. So I thought a long time and said, well, you know, we're, we're a, bit, uh, a bit messed up anyway here. And then I had a, a brainwave. I went in and did a journal entry and I did a credit of 100 and I turned the computer off and hoped for the best. Uh, and luckily, when we switched it on again and it booted up, the thing was brought into balance. But I was kind of a, a, a badly designed system, a properly designed computer system, would ask you for the debit, ask you for the credit, and only when it had both and you press post, would it kind of do both simultaneously. How do we record the system? And we have, first of all, narrative notes. In other words, you write a little essay, a little paragraph saying what has happened. So this would literally say something like, uh, when goods are received, uh, the uh, staff in the goods receiving bay in the warehouse have to count the goods and they compare that to what was ordered. And if the goods that they've received agrees to what is ordered, then they sign the copy order as evidence that this check has been carried out. And then we'll go on to the second paragraph. They would pass, say, a, a, an approved copy of the order and the goods received note. They would pass this to the accounting department who would file these two documents awaiting the invoice. Pretty quick to do. Uh, and, and generally speaking, narrative notes would be the method which would be adopted in a small, simple organization. And I should say, if I just go back uh, uh, one slide here, that this segregation of duties here, it is going to be easiest to do in large organizations. 
in large organizations, you can employ one person to place the orders, another person to receive the orders, a third person to, to check the invoices. In small organizations, with maybe only two people in the accounting department, segregation of duties is quite a difficult one to achieve. Uh, and, and really, you find an awful lot of the transactions are all carried out by one person. And that's the sort of place where a, a narrative description is going to be probably used. What you rely on in a situation with poor segregation of duties uh, is these tend to be small firms where the owner is also the, the managing director or the, the accountant. And you will normally say that we are relying on you as the owner and the chief accountant to be personally, closely supervising the operation of the accounting system. So anyway, narrative notes. The problem with narrative notes, although they're quick, uh, is that, as what do I want to say? That there's no generally accepted format for putting those into. Uh, different, you know, some people can be very short and succinct. Other people ramble on, and you, 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 it's hard to know what on earth is happening in this two-page essay uh, about receiving goods. Uh, and then, irritatingly, some people leave documents kind of hanging, you know? They will say that when an order is placed, three copies of the order are raised. One goes to the supplier, one stays in the warehouse that so they know they've ordered the goods, and they don't tell you anything about the third. It's kind of hanging around somewhere, and you don't know whether it's destroyed, whether it's passed somewhere else, whether it's filed. So there's a bit of a lack of discipline in narrative notes. In large, larger uh, clients, many firms of accountants will suggest... Uh, that they or will use flowcharts. These are flowcharts of the documentation and where it flows and what happens to it. So uh, typically what it's going to look like, I'm not going to put particular labels on it here, uh, but you have a, a kind of a flow line going down. You won't be asked to do this in the exam, uh, but you may be asked just to talk about advantages, disadvantages of flowcharts here. Uh, and let's say they, you know, they raise, a, you know, maybe... And the different firms have got different kinds of uh, uh, flowcharting conventions. But let's say they raise here you know, a two-part purchase order. And they'll say that uh, one of these here uh, is going to be filed. And maybe it's going to be filed in numerical order because these are going to be, excuse me, these are going to be numerically controlled documents. And the other one here, uh, is going to go off to a supplier. Now, this isn't very good. Uh, it, it, well, it's okay. It's only a little example. Uh, but what's very important here uh, is that we see, as auditors, where controls take place. Uh, and very often the controls have got a special symbol so maybe here what we have, uh, let's say it's a, an X uh, that, that symbolizes controls in this flowcharting convention. This is where maybe the order is authorized. So one of the things we'd be interested in, 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 in evaluating the purchasing system, is whether or not orders can just be kind of sent out at random or whether they have to go through some sort of authorization procedure uh, before they can be sent out to suppliers. So, so these uh, uh, flowcharts follow very close conventions. There are a number of them here. Uh, people have to be taught how to do it. Uh, and, and it's actually quite time consuming uh, to, to draft these flowcharts out. Nowadays, it would be done on, on, on computers using uh, kind of graphic systems and so on there. But nevertheless, the, the level of detail you get into is is, is, is quite fine. Uh, but it may be necessary in large organizations with complex systems of internal control, where you would probably get lost in the narrative notes. You lose track of what's happening. The third method are, is questionnaires. And there are two forms of uh, questionnaires an internal control questionnaire and an internal uh, 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 control evaluation questionnaire. 
An internal control questionnaire, what you want, uh, what's a good sign is the answer yes, okay? This means that a particular control is operating, is present and, is, and should be operating. In an internal control evaluation questionnaire, the answer you want is really no. It's really saying, could a particular problem occur? So, let's go back and think about uh, our problem with uh, overtime and whether or not it is authorised or not. Uh, in the internal uh, control questionnaire, there would be a question in the order documentation which would say, is overtime authorised by the employee's manager? And you want the answer yes. And if you get the answer yes, you know there's a control in place. And we can then rely on that later on. We could look at some overtime claims or some time sheets and see have they been authorised, you know. Because there we are beginning to rely on the company system, the supervisor, if you like, or the manager, making sure that unauthorised overtime has not been paid. If we're doing it with an internal control evaluation questionnaire, the question will be turned round slightly and it would say something like, can unauthorised overtime be paid? And we want the answer no to that. Why perhaps could it not be paid? And one reason is maybe it's authorised. Uh, another reason that unauthorised overtime cannot be paid is maybe you don't pay overtime. Maybe it's just a, even if people walk, work a couple of hours longer, you don't pay overtime. So, so obviously unauthorised overtime cannot be paid. Uh, another way in which you might prevent this uh, happening uh, is that maybe what you do is you compare the the, the, the actual wages to, to a budget and once you get to the budget you stop paying it. It's not a very good control. So so the internal control questionnaire is very, very specific, you know. Uh, uh, relatively unskilled auditors can answer this question. Is um, are, are uh, uh, timesheets authorised by the manager uh, as authorization of overtime? The answer is just yes or no. It's a really easy question to answer. When you get down to can unauthorized overtime be paid, and there may be several ways in which you can stop unauthorized overtime be paid, it will probably take a slightly more skilled auditor to assess whether or not a particular mechanism they have discovered will stop on authorised overtime being paid. But it is more flexible. It is not saying the only way you can stop on authorised overtime is by having authorizations. There may be other mechanisms in place which will effectively uh, uh, enforce a control. Control objectives, procedures and tests. Uh, the, 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 the questionnaires, this, this links back to the questionnaires here, a control objective is something you want to attain, some form of uh, uh, objective you want to obtain, like we don't want unauthorised overtime being paid, we don't want goods being ordered which we don't need, we don't want credit being given to somebody who's never going to pay us. That's the objective. The control procedures are specific ways in which that objective could be met. Uh, so we authorise overtime, uh, we authorise orders being sent out to suppliers, uh, uh, or we take uh, credit references on people, on new customers, so that that's the way in which you would stop maybe credit being given to on credit worthy new customers. And then what we have to do as auditors, having th thought we have, we, we have found out how these control objectives and procedures are operating, then what we have to do is to test. And if it was the overtime one, uh, we would inspect the timesheets, we would look for the, uh, the the manager's signature. If it was testing the control that we only give new credit to people once they've passed some sort of credit reference test, we would say, well, could I see the credit reference tests, uh, uh, the credit reference uh, replies, if you like, for these five new customers that you've put on your uh, uh, customer list this year. 
what are the uh, tests of control? And it's a bit like we had, you know, how do we get ordered evidence? And there we had, if you remember, we had analytical procedures, inquiry and confirmation, inspection, observation, recalculation, reperformance. And we said back then that the last four of those are methods in which you can test controls. Uh, you can inquire, inquire of people, do you always authorize orders? It's not great. Okay? Inquire of people, do you always take up uh, credit references on new suppliers? They'll probably say yes. I mean, it's not a great control, a uh, great test of control, but it, you may as well ask the question. Much better one is to inspect. Yeah. So, do you always authorize overtime? Uh, yes, I do. Well, could you? Could I see some timesheets? And then you inspect them to see the signature. Uh, could you inspect the, the 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 information coming from the credit reference agency? Observation: Do you count the goods when they come in? Yes. And then you go down to the warehouse and you watch them testing the goods, counting the goods as they come in. And we talked earlier about recalculation and reperformance. Do you carry out bank reconciliations? Yes. Could I see a bank reconciliation? Yes, here it is. But if you remember, uh, I said that you, you don't really know if the bank reconciliation has been done correctly unless you reperform it, unless you recalculate it yourself to make sure the person isn't just filling in random numbers uh, to make it reconcile. When you find a weakness in internal control, uh, it is uh, uh, the duty of auditors uh, to uh, communicate uh, significant deficiencies to those charged with governance. And those charged with governance in a company would be the board of directors or at least the order committee. Uh, in a hospital, it might, it might be the, the, the board of governors. In a charity, it might be the trustees. So the people at the top are the ones who were large, important uh, uh, deficiencies uh, are found in the system of internal control. And because of this deficiency in the internal control system, a material misstatement could occur. More trivial weaknesses in the system of internal control, you, you don't want to necessarily bother the people at the top, uh, and uh, you're probably going to uh, notify those to uh, management and, uh, rather than, you know, if you if you communicate too much relatively trivial stuff to people at the top, then it's hard for them to do, to you know to say is this important or not important. You want to send the really important stuff to the people at the top, and, and the less important stuff you can report to management. The standard, what's called sometimes management letter, or sometimes called a letter of weakness, weakness and in internal control, has three columns. This is quite a common requirement in exam questions. First column, you describe what is the weakness. Second column, it's a selling exercise. You're saying, and therefore this could happen. And the third column, this could be prevented by doing that. Okay. So the weakness might be you do not take up credit references on new customers. The consequences uh, you are extending uh, credit to customers who may not be credit worthy and therefore you could suffer large bad debts. And the fix is usually then simple once you've got the first two columns in there. The fix is uh, it is recommended that for every new customer you take up full credit references. Even in well-designed internal control systems, even in the best regulated companies, Nevertheless, there will be inherent uh, limitations on internal control. Uh, they are not a guarantee that absolutely everything has worked perfectly. And first of all, there is human error. Uh, so I raise uh, an order, uh, maybe with the wrong part number, I'm ordering the wrong part. Uh, the, the next person in line doesn't spot that. And then when the invoice comes in, everything seems to be tying up and so on uh, to the correct product being ordered. And, and we could have spent quite a bit of money uh, just by human error in ordering the wrong part. And human error is always a factor in accounting. 
hopefully with good internal control and segregation of duties, the second or third person in line will, will spot the human error, but sometimes it gets through. Collusion. Remember, segregation of duty was, was to kind of uh, uh, try to uh, reduce this potentially fraudulent cooperation. Uh, but nevertheless, sometimes people will do it. Sometimes people will get together, two or three of them, uh, and commit a fraud uh, where they are all involved. Bypass of controls. Bypass of controls is sometimes done for noble purposes, for good purposes. So let's say I had forgotten uh, to order some goods. And we see the goods are very, very low now in the warehouse. Uh, and uh, tomorrow we're going to run out of this raw material. This will mean the production line stops. Uh, people are going to be wasting their time and we're going to disappoint customers for whom we're making the product. So we have a bit of an emergency on our hands. So maybe what I do, instead of going through the proper procedures for getting authorization for orders being placed, I just phone up the supplier and say, look, we're a bit of an emergency here. Could you quickly supply these goods? So I bypass the controls, as I say, very often for good purposes. But once you have bypassed the controls, then of course, there's a possibility of errors being introduced. Costs and benefits. Uh, many uh, uh, trivial transactions, you're not going to institute any controls for it. I suppose, strictly speaking, you should lock away pens and paper in a filing cabinet and only issue pens and paper and inkjet ink and so on uh, when uh, employees come with a properly authorised requisition note. Uh, but, but you have to think, well, the pens and papers, a few cartridges of inkjet ink and so on there. Uh, maybe the costs of going through this and the delay of going through all of this stuff on authorizing this is is going to be much greater than the benefits. And finally, non-routine non -routine transactions, uh, transactions which are sufficiently rare uh, so that we have not actually set up a system. Uh, an example might be uh, selling second-hand cars. So generally speaking, in companies, uh, when when you are buying cars for employees, there's quite a good system. Uh, a car is expensive. It's a substantial amount of expenditure there. And, and they're, 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 they're usually quite close systems to authorise the expenditure, to set price limits, to, to get good deals and, and so on. Uh, however, when you come to, to sell the old car, of course this is well depreciated and so on, and it's a bit of a nuisance, it's not as exciting as selling an old car, uh, uh, th there's a danger that maybe these cars are sold at a price which is below what they really could have fetched. That there's no system there maybe for saying if you're selling the old car, you have to get you know quotes from three different garages or something and go for the best possible quote. So sometimes these are non-routine transactions, uh, and, and, and sometimes they're quite large. Uh, almost, uh, almost by definition, if it's fairly non-routine, it's, it's, it's probably, it's rare. There's a good chance they're going to be quite large, uh, and sometimes they can kind of slip through the internal control net.